What are we doing today? We're going to figure out how do we get students engaged, and the way we're going to figure that out is by reversing that and asking how do you prevent students from becoming disengaged. So what I did is I went to my students and I asked the second question, when do students give up in school? And what I was trying to get at is, when do you become disengaged? Like, when do you just go, ah, I've had it. The first one, they said, when they're facing other issues. Another one is when they're afraid of making mistakes. They disengage because it's, it's just too hard, or they're perceiving like it's too hard, and they don't want to, like, jump into it. Another one, they don't see the benefits of school. Like, they don't, they don't, why do I need to be in biology? What, what's the point of third grade? Four, when they think the teacher's being unfair. I didn't think of that one. That's what they gave me. They said, well, my teacher's being unfair. That's when I'm like, all right, I'm not going to listen to you. Number five, when they're apathetic, which is a huge idea. And then last one, when they don't have a sense of community, when they're not connected to school, they don't have friends, um, they, don't, they, don't, they just don't feel like anyone's there for them. This morning, I'm going to go through each one of these, you know, systematically, I'm going to give you strategies for each one of them. Strategies you can use in the classroom that you can apply next week. When they're facing other issues, we have no control over those issues. Poverty, divorce, there's all sorts of things happening in students' lives, and we have no control. So the strategy is simple, right? The only strategy we can use is the great commandment, which is know thy students. So and obviously there's some things that go with that. You know, the first day, learn names as fast as possible. Right? If you teach high school, you have 200 students, you learn those names as quick as possible, and you purposely think, okay, the students that are hiding from me are the ones I need to go seek. Connecting to students is what matters here. Then you know what's going on like, in their life, and then when something happens, you're more likely to recognize it and realize, hey, that kid has, has nothing to do with class and school. It has everything to do with something else at home. All right, let's move on to the next one when they're afraid of making mistakes. Take a look at this. My sons, uh, David and James, they're uh, seven and nine, and one time, this is last year, we went to the local skate park, and they're like, Daddy, we we, they, they drive the, the scooters, you know, those little Razor scooters, and they're like, let's go to the skate park. I'm like, okay, sure, and I, I used to skateboard when I was, you know, in the 80s, I was pretty good on the street, and I was like, I'm gonna go skate with you guys, awesome. I grab my skateboard, and I get there, and there's all these kids, little kids, doing jumps and jumping over stuff, and they're all doing this awesome things. There's guys on bikes going around, and I really wanted to. I really wanted to get in there, at least try, at least drop in, right? And I wasn't necessarily afraid of getting hurt. I was afraid of looking stupid. And I, I actually, ref I mean, I completely disengaged myself. I said, the kids were like, oh, come on, Dad, jump in, try it, try it. I'm like, no, no, I don't really want to. And I held back, not because I didn't want to, because I was too afraid. So here's your strategy that goes along with it. Reduce the fear. Fear doesn't motivate students. It, it motivates the short run, but it doesn't motivate them in the long run. So we have to tell them, listen, I'm here for you. This is going to be hard. You're going to get pushed. This is going to be difficult, but that's okay. That's part of the process. So it'll make more sense maybe with an example. So let me give you an example. Take your right hand, if you could. Right hand, then do this. Don't, don't look up here. Just look at me. Okay. Like this. Thumb out, put it away, pinky out. Thumb out, pinky out. Thumb out, pinky out. Thumb out, pinky out. Perfect. Awesome. Now, two hands. Same thing over again. Thumbs out, pinkies out. Thumbs out, pinkies out. Boop, beep. You can show your partner. Look what I can do. Wee. Great. Awesome. Now here's what I want you to do. Just watch me. Thumb out, pinky out. Thumb out, pinky out. Looks like this. Thumb out, pinky out. Thumb out, pinky out. Looks like this. Da, 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 da. You okay? Okay. <laughs> This is called experiential learning. I love doing these activities in the classroom. Um, let's, let's debrief this. Let's talk about how this is like classroom, because it's exactly the same as school. When I first had you do one-handed, a lot of you guys are like, this is so easy. Like, I can do this all day long. Right? And I had two hands. You're like, duh, I can do this. Uh. What happened in the third round? Uh, hold on a second. See you know what I'm saying? Now, what was your attitude when you couldn't do it? Did you give up? You have this is stupid. I should never have become a teacher and like ran off. School is exactly the same way. Now, who in this room is really good at it? Um, who? Fingers or school? This. <laughs> Who's really good at this? You. you I you am. Best. And who am I? Teacher. I'm the teacher. I am so good at economics. I am so good. I can do all the calculations and all the graphs, and I require no thought and no energy whatsoever. It is so easy for me. But not because I'm brilliant. It's not because I'm a genius. Why is it? Because I practice, I practice economics, and there's been times in my life it was really hard, and it took time for me to learn, and now it's so easy. So your students walk in the room, they see you doing things, but the kids go, oh, I can't do it. I don't know how to do this. That's okay. It takes time. I'm there for you. It, it doesn't motivate you and make you do this any better by me yelling at you or screaming at you or being like, well, it's your grade if you don't do this, right? Or there's going to be a huge test on Friday. It's all about, listen, you've got to practice. And if you're not getting it, you've got to practice.
Now here's the, really, here's the biggest problem in education. Students feel like they need to get it. There is nothing to get. There's no place to be. You will always be at the fringe of your capabilities. I'll say it again. You'll always be at the fringe of your capabilities. You might have mastered one thing, but the next thing comes up. So next time, once you get this down, how about now rotate your wrists, do the same thing, hopping on one foot, because that's all education is. It's the process of learning and figuring, okay, I can't do this. Okay, but now I get it, and now I can move on. Now, what's great about this activity is you use this to explain to students that mastering skills requires practice, and you don't give up, right? It's going to be hard. Reduce the fear. Tell them, I'm there for you. I'm going to help you practice, but eventually you're going to get it, but you've got to practice. If you say this sentence to students, it won't sink in. If you say, hey, guys, make sure you practice, it doesn't sink in. When you do activities like this, experiential learning activities, students go, oh, yeah. So in my class, I'll do this at the beginning of the year, and when we get to things in my class, like, you know, you know two months into school, I'll be like, all right, guys, today's one of those days. You know what I'm saying? It's going to start off easy. We're going to start off with consumer surplus. Then we'll talk about producer surplus, and we'll put it all together and talk about total surplus, and that's when it gets hard. So stay with me the whole time. Does that make sense? And I guarantee there's areas in your curriculum where students are like, oh, this is so easy. I can do this all the time. And all of a sudden, when, they get, when it gets hard, they go, oh, I can't do it. And they become disengaged. They ask to go to the bathroom every two minutes, and they try to get out of it, right? As opposed to realize, it is always going to be hard. Education is always hard, right? The process of learning takes time. Let me give you an example from sports. I bet there's some sports nuts out there. So let's talk about Jerry Rice. I don't know if you know much about Jerry Rice. All-time leader in receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns. Voted greatest NFL football player of all time. Not like a good one, the greatest one by NFL Films. What can you say about the video, though? <laughs> he made mistakes. Great people aren't great because they don't make mistakes. They are great because they get up and try over again. Right? It's so hard to learn that, though. I mean, it's so hard. It, it's hard for me to learn that when I'm trying to skateboard at a skate park, right? But we got to teach our students, I'm here for you. It's going to be hard. It's going to take time. You gotta reduce that fear. Reason number three is when students don't see the benefits of school. Right? They just, they go, I don't know why I'm here. This is just a waste of my time. Right? It's hard for them to stay engaged if they don't know why they're there. So I found this quote on Twitter. This is great. Strong teachers don't teach content. Google has content. Strong teaching connects learning in ways that inspire kids to learn more and strive for greatness. So most of you, and I'd say all of you, were like me when it came to school, right? When you had a book report on Peru, what'd you do? And when you were in school, education's changed, but when you were a kid, what happened? You went to the library and you opened up an encyclopedia. And, if, and that like 10 pages on Peru, if there wasn't information in there about Peru, that information didn't exist. There was no more information about Peru except it was in the encyclopedia. Right? But our kids, our students, have grown up in a completely different world. All the rote memorization stuff is right there. And they're thinking like, why do I need to learn any of this from you if it's right here? Why are you testing me on things that is really just a Google search from my phone away, right? And the answer is you're not. It's all about the skills. If very few of our students will use the content we teach every day, I'm talking about the rote memorization content stuff, like the, the things a lot of times that you just do a quick quiz on, then what do we really want them to walk away with? Remember when you were in high school though, you had a math teacher that told you, you'll be using this for the rest of your life. Remember that, right? <laughs> when was the last time you used the quadratic formula? Yeah, probably high school. Now, who used it just on Friday? So who used it probably all last week and will use it all next week? That math teacher. They weren't lying. They use it every single day. But I don't. Now, I'm not making fun of math. I use the idea and the skills of math every day. Every single day I'm using math. But it's not the quadratic formula. So here's the question, right? What do we want them to walk away when it comes to math or social science or English or P or foreign language or art or whatever you teach or just third grade, like you teach third grade. What do we want them really to walk away with? So here's my point and here's the big strategy. You gotta get a sales pitch, right? You gotta get a sales pitch. No more than two sentences. So we're gonna do it right now. What I want you to do is you're gonna go back to that partner from before. I want you to tell them really quickly, what, what do you teach? 
be a high school teacher or you know, elementary school, middle school teacher, and then give them no more than two cents sales pitch on why on earth kids should be in your class. Ask yourself, and be honest, when was the last time you said that sentence to students? It should have been Friday. It should have been, all, it should have been at some point last week. The reality is, and I'm the same way, I forget. I'm so focused on the content we're doing today and this week, and you're not getting the content we're doing this week, that I'm not thinking, well, there's something bigger here, and I gotta focus on that. So the strategy here is you gotta connect every single lesson to what students really need to understand, right? I mean, obviously, there's the content, there's the minutia you gotta get done, but every single day, you should be like, hey, here's why you're here again. This is gonna help you achieve that goal. Students all the time say, I hate math, or I hate English, or I hate PE. And what I've done is I've done a translation for those students. By the way, you're going to get this PowerPoint, so if some people are writing things down, you're going to be fine. You're going to get this. So a kid who says, I hate math, is really trying to say, I hate problem solving and learning from my mistakes. I'm never going to use that in life. A kid goes, I hate math, but I love working on cars. It's the same thing. Where did you make a mistake? Where did you mess up? What's the algorithm? All right, we're not getting spark. We're not getting uh, gas. We're, and that's the same process that you're using. A kid who says, I hate English. Any English teachers? We're all English teachers, by the way, right? So I hate English. I hate reading and effectively communicating with other people. I'm not going to do that. When am I ever going to communicate with other people? I hate science. I hate thinking objectively and figuring out how things work. Right? I, that's, that's a waste of my time. Kid says, I hate history. A lot of kids say that, right? I hate history basically saying, I hate knowing who I am and how I got here. Right? Kid who says, I hate foreign language. I hate other cultures and developing a skill that will get me a better job someday. Right? Because it will do that. Right, I hate PE. I think this is interesting. Kids go, maybe not in elementary or middle school. I, 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 my kids love PE in elementary school. They love gym. But in high school, a lot of kids go, oh, I hate PE. Because they're start, trying to say, I hate being healthy. Right? <laughs> they, I really hate it. I hate being healthy. I hate school is trying to say, I hate staying focused, working hard, multitasking, and applying skills that will decrease the likelihood that my life will suck. Right? <laughs> so I want you to ask yourself, when you hear kids say, I hate school, I picture that kid in your mind. Which kids are the ones who usually say, I hate school? It's ones who need school. The ones who need school the most to get out of poverty, to get out of situations that are beyond their control, and their life is going to be really difficult. Then they're the other ones, oh, they want to be disengaged. They want to step back. I hate school. Man, do you need to be engaged, right? And so when a kid says, I hate school, we, that's us. That's not them. It's us. We're not selling it properly. We're not explaining what the point is of biology or third grade. Right? And if we do that, obviously you're still going to have some kids who go, I hate this, but really they're going to realize, well, I hate this, but man, this is actually going to improve my life. Is there any Canadians in the room? I know that's a weird question. My wife is Canadian, and Shreddies is a cereal that's only offered in Canada, the UK, and South Africa. That's it. In 2007, they were trying to get people to buy more Shreddies. They thought, so how should we get people to buy Shreddies? Should we have a funny commercial? Should we have like a new cartoon character? And they came up with an idea, and it has everything to do with teaching. You'll see. It's right here. Eyes up here. Take a look. Here's their idea. Diamond Shreddies. <laughs> First of all, you're thinking, man, consumers are stupid. Yes, maybe a little bit. Their sales didn't go up. They skyrocketed. Yes. Now, you're thinking, you're thinking like, oh, it's dumb. But people would be walking down the aisle, and they'd see this Diamond Shreddies. <laughs> it's so dumb. We should buy a couple of those. You're not just an educator. You're a salesman. Your job is to sell. I sell economics to a bunch of students who aren't particularly interested in buying economics. You sell third grade or kindergarten or biology. What do most teachers do in high school and middle school first day? Classroom management, Classroom management and the syllabus, right? Here's the book, here's what you're supposed to do, here's what you're not supposed to do, uh, here's the syllabus, right? It is the worst day of school. It is so horribly boring by your last class. You're like, okay, here's the syllabus, here's what you're supposed to do. Here's the strategy. Do it this year, I promise you, if there's only one thing you can do, it'll make a huge difference, it's right here. Teach your best lesson the first day. So when kids come into your room, first thing you start off with is your best possible lesson. And I'm not talking content-wise. I'm talking about get them engaged. Get them excited about coming. The syllabus can wait. Like, do the syllabus later. Do classroom rules later. If you teach third grade, do something awesome in third grade. Like, this is what the sort of things we're going to be doing and learning. And that's going to get them excited about wanting to come back. i got to finish the story, by the way. Some Canadians were actually really upset that they, they did this. That they're like, how dare you change our cereal? So take a look up here. The Post decided to make everybody happy with this. The combo pack. <laughs> All in one box.